My name is David Heinemeyer Hansen. I am the CTO and co-owner of 37 Signals, and we have left the cloud. When we first launched our initial software as a service product, Basecamp in 2004, there was no cloud. If you wanted to host things on the internet, you would perhaps rent a computer, but it was a very specific engagement with a small provider in a data center somewhere. Then, I forget the specific date, 2006 maybe, Amazon comes out with S3, the first major cloud service, and already then I thought like, you know what, this is a good idea. Storing massive amounts of data is actually rather difficult. I can see the idea, I can see the premise here, I, I can see the economies of scale that might be able to happen, but we didn't jump on right away. We did a bunch of calculations. Does this make sense? Can we do it cheaper ourselves? And at that time, we still could. And it really didn't take more than a few more years until the math did change. And suddenly, when we reran our calculations, especially for something like file storage, it was cheaper to go with a cloud provider. And I went, this is amazing, this is progress, this is how it's supposed to be. I would like the idea that I don't have to worry about hardware anymore. That is an appealing idea, especially to people like me who make software. We started dipping our toes into the cloud in the early 2010s. And then around 2014, 15, we started migrating parts of our applications over there. We started planning that we were gonna do it. And we set a commitment in part informed by the hype that we should just be 100% cloud. I remember the argument that seemed to make so much sense at the time, which was, are you making your own power? Do you have your own power plant in your backyard? No? Well, that makes sense, right? You're not in the power making business. You just buy it from power company. That is what cloud is. Are you in the business of running and operating hardware? No, you should just buy that as a service. And it made so much sense at the time, in part because there was such a push from so many people at the same time that cloud is the future. The reality though was that the entire pitch, everyone should move all of their stuff to the cloud and 100% of everything you should do should be there was false from the get-go. That was marketing. And it took us, it took me, quite a few years to unwind from that, to open my eyes and see, do you know what? This whole premise does not make sense. And it didn't really hit me until our cloud budgets were really large, well into the millions. You start getting this nagging feeling of like, shouldn't it be cheaper? Why are we spending so much more than we were before, yet we're not really doing more? We're not able to have a smaller team. We need the same number of people doing it. The cloud was supposed to be easier, it was supposed to be more productive, and it was supposed to be cheaper. And the fundamental conclusion we reached was that by and large, it is not easier, it is not faster, and it is not cheaper. And that was really the analysis that brought us to committing to our cloud exit. We are a relatively small company. We don't get special favors from the cloud providers. We essentially pay list price or close to it, or the discounts that are available are the same that are available to everyone else, which means that the prices aren't actually that good, yet we still spend a lot. For us, our cloud budget in 2022 was 3.2 million. The vast majority of that was spent with AWS, a good chunk of that on S3, but then all the other services. And it was really just the size of that bill, 3.2 million, in a company with 80 employees, something's not right. That was a hyper-optimized cloud budget. We had squeezed out simply everything to get peak efficiency, to get peak commitment such that we could get the absolute lowest bills possible. But that wasn't how it ran all the time. We got to that place by getting some really nasty surprises on cloud bills that were just nuts on things that we had over-provisioned or we had forgotten about, we had left turned on. Trying to figure out what we're spending on exactly what for whom is really difficult. At our company, we had to designate someone on the operations team 
to essentially learn accounting. Can you figure out how to attribute the spend into the correct budget system? We can even have a vague, fuzzy idea of what we're spending on what and when and how we could actually optimize it. It turns out it's really, really difficult. And of course it's really difficult because it's totally in the interest of the cloud providers to make it difficult. The harder it is to understand your bill, the harder it is to optimize your bill. And this is where you get this uh, fox in a hen house dynamic, where the cloud providers will go down, no, 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 we'll help you. We'll help you understand your bill. We'll help you optimize your bill. What are you talking about? You will never get straight up advice from someone who benefits from you not having that advice. When you buy your own stuff, you scrutinize things far more, but the scrutinization is done essentially once. We placed a very large order to buy a bunch of new services to make the cloud access possible. And we spent a fair amount of time negotiating that, um, figuring out exactly what we needed. The scrutiny though was localized up until the point of the buy. Once that buy was done, do you know what? These servers are gonna serve us well for the next five years. We don't have to worry about it again. There's not gonna be a surprise bill from, oh, you used a little bit too much of your data, but yeah, but I already bought it. It's mine. There are no more additional overages or any of that other stuff. When I look at other companies who have more traditional cloud bills, that is unoptimized cloud bills or poorly optimized, I could totally see how our budget of 3.2 million could have been 10 million, easily. Which means when we talk about the savings that we are likely to reap from our cloud exit, they're incredibly modest compared to what's possible in the largest majority of corporations who are using vast majority of the cloud stuff. Because the savings from an unoptimized cloud build absolutely nuts. Do you know what? This isn't just about cost. There's a bunch of other factors here. For example, do we want the internet running on just the computers of five large cloud providers? Is that the marvel that DARPA designed back in the 70s? No, absolutely not. So for people like me who've been around since, I want to say the start, the mid 90s, when the internet first burst onto the scene, who owe their entire careers to the internet, seeing that wither away and getting consolidated, that seemed like exactly the wrong direction. It seemed to go against the grain of what made the internet so special. It was the decentralization. It was the fact that you didn't need to ask anyone for permission. It was the fact that if you could plug a computer into an ethernet connection connected to the internet, you were there, you were reachable in just the same way as someone who owned the biggest data center in the world. That is such a beautiful, democratizing, market-friendly ideal, and we should seek to protect that. So people like me, who owe their careers to it, should think a little bit more about where is this all going, and why is it going in that direction, and are we playing a part in something that we wouldn't want to see the end of? So I think what's so interesting about the cloud exit discussion is the number of people who've treat the idea of owning your own hardware and operating it with a direct sense of connection to it, knowing even what it is, and treating that as though that is forgotten knowledge, as though we don't know how to build this anymore. When in fact, every single company that operated on the internet 10 years ago, they knew it. Those people aren't dead. They're still around. Like all of that knowledge, all of that expertise is there just under the surface, but it is treated as though it's lost, as it's hidden. That if you start it on the cloud, well, what are you gonna do? No one knows how to do any of this stuff anymore. And I think that's one of those great fallacies that the major cloud providers really bank on, that this knowledge is gone and it would be too complicated. You can't even hire for it anymore. And it's just all bollocks. And the reason it's all bollocks is that operating your own hardware is very much like operating rented hardware. When you operate and own your own hardware, you're still running virtual machines on them. You're still running much of the same software. You need a database? Well, you're running Postgres or you're running MySQL. Operating those databases is still something you have to be concerned about, whether you're renting your hardware, whether you're buying your hardware. But there's such a appeal from the cloud provider's perspective to make it seem so difficult to make it seem like they have some secret sauce here that you can never understand that these are some hidden herbs and spices and 
You just can't make it yourself. And if you try, you're gonna make it very poorly. Oh, and what about security? And what about all these other things, right? This is what a lot of folks forget. They think they're buying a service that's some sort of sophisticated, automated software solution. When in reality, they're not just renting the cloud providers' computers, they're renting their people. They're just paying consultants to operate those services for them. And those consultants are no smarter than the consultants that you can buy or train. The complication of running things on our own hardware and the setup gymnastics that you have to do are so similar to what you have to do on the cloud. There's a little bit, you shouldn't totally underplay it. There's something you need to learn, but compared to everything else you need to learn to run modern services on the internet, small potatoes. Owning your own hardware does not mean being next to it. It doesn't mean physically touching it. It doesn't even mean unwrapping the box when it arrives. This is the other misconception. Oh, how do you even do this? Are you racking it in your office? No, what are you talking about? Are you building a data center? Hell no, these are hundreds of millions of dollar projects. You don't need to do any of that. There are thousands of data centers around the world that you can rent a cabinet in. We rent eight cabinets across two data centers. The boxes that we order get drop shipped straight there. We then hire a white glove company that operate in those data centers that do actually have employees on site to unbox them, take the computer, slot it into one of those racks that we have, plug ethernet in, plug power in, and then a few minutes later we see an IP address turn green. And now we can work with it in almost the same way as you would work with a cloud VM. From that perspective, it's really similar. When things break down, say hard drive goes bad, we'll get an alert in our systems and we will ask the white glove, hey, do you know what? Could you go change the hard drive? There are nothing different in the gymnastics of operating these things. It's just whether you own it, whether you see it and how much you pay for it. word cloud, it so perfectly encapsulates the obfuscation of what's actually going on. Your visibility is reduced. You cannot see the actual mountain that's hiding behind these clouds, the actual physicality, the stuff that you can touch. We've lost sense of that, that machines and computers, they are physical things. They have little CPUs in them and they have hard drives or SSDs and RAM and all this other stuff. And I think when we lose contact with that. We also lose contact with uh, the progress that underpins it all, which is very much to the benefit of the cloud. When I started talking about our cloud exit, I was actually a little mad. I was first of all a little mad at myself because I should have known better. I should have known and picked up on the fact that the cloud providers currently, especially the biggest one, is making untold sums of money over the fact that all this progress that's happening at the physical layer, the CPUs getting faster, the SSD drives getting faster, are not being passed on. We don't even know which generation of SSDs we're on. We don't even know what the fundamental performance characteristics of our CPUs are. And when we can't see those things, there's an information asymmetry that the large cloud providers can abuse to just charge way more than what's reasonable. We're being totally honest about the fact that we did the analysis, we ran the numbers, they did not add up, and now we're going. And that that's even possible. The reaction when we started sharing our cloud exit journey of it was, was really split into two parts. There was the mass public authentic reaction, in my opinion, that was like, wow, A, I didn't realize it, or B, which was usually the most passionate responses, was I had this nagging sense too. I sort of did the numbers, it wasn't quite clear, but I couldn't make it work. I couldn't understand why everyone was doing this. And when I tried to do the numbers, they didn't add up. Why was everyone doing it? Well, I must be the dumb one. This appearance that unless you're all in on the cloud narrative, you're outdated. Because cloud is newer, than being on-prem, ergo, it must be better. What? We go down blind alleys in technology all the time and have to backtrack from ideas perhaps that weren't any good at all or ideas that perhaps were decent but couldn't be pushed that far. So the fact that we have to backtrack, the fact that we so publicly backtracked 
and that we weren't making these arguments from a position of financial incentive. But there was also a contingency of people, usually the ones who had a financial interest in the propagation of the cloud narrative, either because they are from the clouds or because, I mean, in the LinkedIn comments, it literally said on their title, cloud expert. The cloud has been so successful at cultivating an entire cottage industry of experts in all realms, even experts in how to optimize your bill. Now you know that there's something off here if there's room for that amount of proliferation of new roles. And these people are committed to the fact that the cloud must remain the main narrative. It must remain the main track. So when you start pushing back against that, there's some danger signs there. One of the accelerating factors of the whole cloud adoption was an accounting trick. The difference between operational expenditures, OPEX, and capital expenditures, CAPEX. And being able to move spending from CAPEX with depreciation over to OPEX just looked better. It just looked better in the financial accounting. But it wasn't any better. The money is still the money. And I think the realization for us was, do you know what? I own part of this business. I will get a large sum of my wealth if we make more money than we spend. I don't care whether we're spending in OPEX or CAPEX. It's dollar to dollar when it comes to what's left over at the end of the day. And that realization that we can buy something now and we'll pay up front to have it, and then we will depreciate it over three years maybe, and it'll have a useless or useful life of perhaps five years. Do you know what? It doesn't matter. I just look at what's the total sum I will be spending over the next five years on this stuff. If I have to spend a little more upfront to save massively over the next five years, that seems like an absolutely a no-brainer. So I think the cloud providers have preyed on the fact that there's accounting quirks that make certain balance sheets look better, not that they are, look better because you shift money from one bucket over to the other bucket. It's the same money. The buckets are just two different colors. In the end, it all flows into the same thing. We have basically finished the vast majority of our cloud exit. We had seven major applications at the beginning of the year that we had running fully in the cloud. And as of uh, just about a month ago, they're all out which means the computing power, which means the databases, which means the storage, which means the search services, all of those things have been brought to zero. Now, the irony of course is that we're still paying for a bunch of this stuff because the only way to get realistic, affordable prices in the cloud is actually to commit yourself for long-term contracts. So we have some contracts that are bound up on a yearly basis that still haven't expired, even though we've moved everything out. But as soon as those things expire, the cloud bill is gonna crash down to essentially just what we pay for the file storage which is about a third of our overall cloud bill. So we're looking at savings in the realm of a million and a half to $2 million a year. I'd say the main advice to anyone who sees this and may be getting curious is to just start running the numbers yourself. Start figuring out, first of all, I might know what I'm using in the cloud. How does that translate to a physical machine? How many physical machines would I need? What do those physical machines cost? That is actually not that complicated. We had certain workloads where we contrasted what it would cost to buy some search servers versus what we were paying for the managed search. And I think the payback rate was something like five weeks of rental could buy all the servers we needed, servers that would last us five years. Now, it's not always that dramatic, but sometimes it is. And the more of the managed services, the one that cloud love to sell you, the more of those you use, the more dramatic the savings are going to be. So at the very least, just run the numbers. You can get so much computing power in such a small box for such a comparably low price that you go like, how did I even get into the rental idea in the first place? Buying has never been more accessible for more types of startups and companies in general than it is today.